I, Sunidhi, I, Sunidhi Agarwal, Senior Research Assistant at Entry Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Nidhi Anusandhan Sansthan, New Delhi, extend my heartiest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are here for our special series, the state of employment and livelihood hashtag employment debate talk, which is being organized by IMPRI Center for Work and Welfare, along with Counter View. The topic for today's discussion is the state of employment in India, impact and the way forward with special reference to coronavirus pandemic, which is being delivered by Professor Sarthi Achar. We are fortunate to have Professor Santosh Mehrodra as the chair of the session and Dr. Sandhya S. Ayer and Dr. Radhika Kapoor as the discussants of the session. It's been my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce you to the chair of the session, Professor Santosh Mehrodra. Professor Mehrodra is the visiting professor at the Center for Economic Development of the University of Bath, United Kingdom. He has also been a former professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Professor Mehrotra has also been the former director at the Institute of Applied Manpower Research, Niti Aayog, India. With the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce the speaker of the session, Professor Sarthi Acharya. Sir? Please. Thank you, sir. It's been my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Sarthi Acharya who is the Honorary Delhi Chair Professor at the Institute of Human Development, New Delhi. He is also the Managing Director at the Indian Journal of Labor Economics. He has pursued his PhD in Economics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and Advanced Diploma in Development Planning from the Central School of Planning and Statistics, Poland. For the last three decades, Professor Acharya has worked as a Senior Consultant at UNDP India, Thailand, Africa, Addis Ababa of Ethiopia, Mongolia, and at Plan International Global Alliance for Children, Cambodia. Professor Acharya was also the senior consultant and chief technical advisor at the UNDP of Cambodia and Laos. He has also been the director at the Institute of Development Studies, Jaipur, and research director at Cambodia Development Research Institute, Cambodia. Among his many other accomplishments, also includes the Feather of International Labor, Labor Organization, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, and the Indian Council of Social Science Research, New Delhi. Professor Acharya has obtained his grants from Population Council, UN Agencies, International Development Research Center, Rockefeller Foundation, CEDA, DANIDA, DFID, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and Ford Foundation, among others. He has also been the visiting scholar at Boston University, International Institute of Social Sciences, Netherlands, Department of Fisheries Resources Utilization at the Institute Ferdinand Boger University, Indonesia, and in-house consultant at Mauritius Research Council. He has also written four books, over 50 journal publications, and articles in edited books, and three national human development reports, which are supported by UNDP. It's my privilege to be present among such esteemed panelists. And now I would like to introduce Dr. S. Sandhya S. Dr. Sandhya S. Ayer and Dr. Radhika Kapoor. Dr. Sandhya S. Ayer is an associate professor, chairperson at the Center for Public Policy, Habitat, and Human Development, School of Development Studies, Tata Institute for Social Sciences, Mumbai. She has professional experience of over 18 years. As a development economist, Dr. Ayer focuses on poverty, inequality, human development, informal sector workers, and social security and protection related issues of the developing countries. Her current empirical work focuses on sustainable development goals, both across the Indian states and also among the G20 countries. Dr. Ayer has co-authored a book, Human Development in an Unequal World, and has published over 20 articles in various peer-reviewed journals. Presently, she is an active member of the United Nations South-South Cooperation and Triangular Cooperation and an advisor to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific Smart City Project. Dr. Ayer is skilled in policy analysis, big data analysis, program evaluation, and research. She focuses on evidence-based research and policy analysis. Dr. Radhika Kapoor, is a senior visiting fellow at the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. Prior to joining ICRIER, 
She worked at the Planning Commission and at the International Labour Organization, Geneva. Her broad areas of research interest include poverty and inequality, labour economics and industrial performance. She holds a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics, a master's degree from Cambridge University and a bachelor's degree from St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi. I would, I would now like to request the chair of the session to give his opening remarks and deliberation on the topic, which will be followed by the speaker of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sunidhi. Um, I think without much ado, I'm going to request uh, Sarki to start, and I'll reserve my comments to the, to the, to the end. Uh, so, Sarki, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Santosh. <clears throat> it's nice talking to you formally for a change. We've been talking informally for far too long. Uh, I would like to thank Ipri for inviting me to speak on this subject on which I have recently written a couple of articles for a German foundation and uh, they should be published pretty soon. But my starting point is that the employment situation is not something which we are immediately facing. This employment situation has been with us for a while. That means about two decades now, and there has been a gradual change uh, towards deterioration. Uh, why I make this point is primarily because uh, a large number of, uh, I mean, popular scholars, which I see on, uh, on the television and otherwise, start saying things started changing in the last six, seven years. It's not exactly true. Things have started changing much earlier. It's only that the rate of change has been uh, varied from time to time. And uh, there has been some kind of a softer which has come in through higher growth rates, for example, in the, in the earlier part of the century, which absorbed a part of uh, the unemployment situation. But the secular trend towards labor rejection has been there for a while now. In many other countries, I have personally noticed, for example, in the United States, employment becomes a basis for governments to fall. Unfortunately, not in this country, where uh, it's uh, employ unemployment situation, which is pretty grim right now. But then, I mean, uh, it's it's not an issue on which a large number of, uh, of uh, opinion surveys say that th this is something that the government should be positive on. Uh, maybe. But today's presentation, I would like to say employment situation, special disturbances arising from the, uh, the, the COVID-19 situation. So first, let me get to numbers, though I don't want to walk with numbers. Can I have the next slide, please? Arjun, yeah. Now, if you look at this situation, can we uh, have this box out on somewhere else? I mean, when I'm speaking, the numbers are getting covered. And I would like those numbers to be seen. So what I would do is perhaps make this small. And I don't know how to get rid of this. Okay, <clears throat> the labor force in this country, many say it's 503 million, but, that, but our estimates of the IHD show that it's about 486. But the employment has been much lesser as the data would show. So we have a situation where the employment growth has been much slower than the labor force growth. And... Uh, uh, growth rate in employment, if you have a look. Now, how do I see this? Okay, now I can see it clearly that the growth in the labor force is only about 4% and the growth in employment is only about 0.4%. And if I am to believe the population forecast which Santosh has made, this growth rate in the last uh, three, four, five years has been virtually negative according to him. But that depends upon the kinds of labor uh, uh, Employer, uh, this thing, yeah. population forecasts different people make. R shows it's 0.4, H shows it's minus point something. That means there's something very seriously wrong because the trends are similar. So we have a situation where employment is not growing. And if you see, I have really tried to construct a series since 20 years, and the things don't seem to be moving up. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now, if you look at the kinds of workers we have in this country, we have two kinds of workers. And I'd like to take a minute to define a full-time worker who's working for at least 180 days plus <coughs> uh, in a year and part-time workers who work 30 to 180 days. Now, these are generally known as, as uh, main and marginal workers or, 
or subsidiary workers uh, in different uh, domains. But in the international context, we call them full-time and part-time workers. Now, if you notice one thing, this is very interesting, that over time there has been a sharp reduction in the part-time workers, a 51% reduction over the period uh, 2001 to 2019, <clears throat> which shows that people are either working full-time or they are not working. <clears throat> and the full-time employment growth over 2005 to 2020 is about 13%. The employment growth is about 8%. So the trends are the same which we had seen earlier in the previous slide. But the difference is that I'm trying to split full-time employment and part-time employment to show where the, the wedge is. So even in full-time, there has been a reduction, but part-time is the one which, which takes the cake. Can we take the next one, please? Arjun. Yeah. <clears throat> now here is... <clears throat> an interesting slide which shows self-employed uh, workers, unpaid family workers. Now, this unpaid family worker is a strange creature which this country has had for a very long time because a very large number of people worked in, in uh, uh, own farms in the subsistence sector. So this sector was pretty large, particularly in regards to women workers who worked at their own farms before it was out. Uh, and uh, then we have regular employees and casual laborers. Now, if you see the changes, I have given millions to see the magnitudes. I haven't given the percentages because they, they hide the magnitudes. Now, if you <clears throat> see, let us say, one to third row, you would notice that the difference between 2004, 5 and 2019 is here. 19.9 .9 million women have here. 19.9 .9 million women are are not working anymore they have they have kind of and unpaid family workers in general have shown a negative trend in their uh, participation what does this mean <clears throat> that means the labor market is changing towards more of a, a, a i would say a capitalist labor market where earnings wage marginal productivity and these things start mattering above the present mode of production where everybody pulls in and starts working in the Louis scenes. So we, we talk about a situation where the unpaid family workers are the ones which are withdrawing. So starting from the first slide to the second, in the second slide, we saw the part-time workers are withdrawing. In the third slide, we are seeing that the unpaid family workers are the ones which are being hit. The regular employees are the ones which are increasing, which I remember a couple of years back, Radhika had made a presentation in Patiala, where she said, this is a positive sign. And this is what uh, my friend uh, Ajit Ghosh also said, this is a positive sign. But if you look at the numbers, the numbers are not particularly impressive in the sense that if you look at it, it's only 67.5 million per person, <coughs> persons which have, which have made a difference. And that's not very large. What we require is much more. Okay, the casual workers are, are reducing. We can see negative numbers here uh, in casual number, uh, casual workers here, minus eight and minus seven. And this I have in from my field inquiries in at least three districts here and in Delhi, where we've conducted surveys shows that casual workers earlier used to work as casual workers, but now they are working as gig workers or they're working as uh, platform workers if they are a little higher, which means <coughs> that the classification has changed, the nature of the job continues to be the same. And gig and casual and casual workers are the ones, uh, sorry, the gig and uh, platform workers are the ones which don't have any facility in regards to job security and they are very, very dead end jobs. So <clears throat> it's not that casual labor reduction is something to rejoice, it is something which we have to examine in later detail. <clears throat> the next slide, please. Yeah, here is something. The fourth slide, which I'm showing here, is that agriculture is rejecting workers. And if you see 233 to 194 <clears throat> over a period of about 50, about 15 years. Now, there has been a rejection of workers, which even Santosh's paper shows. Uh, the several papers which is in unemployment. Uh, we have also find that found that there has been a distinct reduction and the manufacturing sector has, has hardly taken up any load. And it's essentially the construction workers. If you look at this logic, there, there are two aspects which uh, call for attention. 
One is that yes, agriculture needs to shed workers because its productivity is, is a fraction of the productivity in the non-farm sectors. To be exact, it's about one fourth, depending upon the sector we're talking about, the state we're talking about. <clears throat> but then the question is, where do these workers go? These workers go in construction. So a farmer is shifting from farming to construction work. It's not much of an upward mobility. It's, it's really a, a downward mobility because they are now working eight hours a day, far away from their workplaces. And we have seen this, we've conducted field works in at least five states for World Bank. And there we found that workers from different states come and stay in temporary camps. They go home for a day or two, you know, <coughs> in two or three months, five days, two or three months, back, which is not the same as working on a farm. So it's really that farm work was, yeah, uh, was 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 bad, and people withdrawing from farm was a good thing. But getting into construction, into manual labor, is is not something which, uh, from an objective point of view, uh, a positive thing to, to happen. And with the group, with the uh, let us say shutdown of the construction sector in in the last few several months, the last last one year at least, these are the persons who have been walking on the streets and all kinds of songs like a hundred days or all kinds of jobs are uh, being lost and people are having a livelihood crisis. It's essentially these kinds of workers who've taken construction and services sector jobs in the <coughs> lower end of, of the economy. Can, so now we have a situation, part-time workers are reducing. We have family workers who are gone and then agriculture is rejecting. So the lower end of the labor force is really finding it difficult to find anything to play. Next one, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> now, if you look at the unemployment rate, this is a fairly familiar figure. US means usual status, means for a long time one has been unemployed. And CW means, uh, WS means current weekly status. <clears throat> now, if you look at the latest ones, uh, mine, there is a, a bit of a cover, but uh, it shows that about 12% of the workers are unemployed. And uh, there are women workers who are more unemployed than the men workers. But when you translate these numbers into, uh, into uh, let us say, <clears throat> actual figures, this turns out to be about 27 million people or 28 million people. That means 27 to 28 million people are openly unemployed looking for jobs. This is just about the largest pool of unemployed people anywhere in the world. So now we have a fifth situation. Part-time workers are gone. <laughs> the unpaid family workers are facing a crisis. And then we have a situation where unemployment is, is, is high. And uh, in the previous slide, we, we saw that uh, agriculture is shedding labor. So it's a kind of a situation where a large number of workers are getting squeezed in the work space. The next one, please. <clears throat> now, unemployment, if you look at the youth, youth are particularly important because these are the people who enter the labor force. And from a political perspective, these are the persons who are also the most volatile workers, uh, likely to create political unrest if stayed unemployed for too long. And we have a situation where uh, in 2017-18, the extent of unemployment is higher than ever before. And uh, this is something which uh, most of the television debates have also brought out that unemployment has been uh, higher, high in the last quarter. 30, 35, 40 years, before which there was no actual measure. Of, before 1972-73, there was really no measure of open unemployment. And 72-73, since then, the concepts have also changed. So for a very, very long time, unemployment is high. So we have a situation of labor not getting very many spaces in the economy. Next, please. <clears throat> now, this is something which is... <clears throat> Uh, an interesting concept, but at the same time, a very green concept. Neat. Neat means those who are not in the labor force, not in education, and not in training. What are these guys doing? Out of every 10 persons in the youth group in 19, 
in the 2018-19 were neat. That means 30 percent of the people were doing nothing. They were they were not in university or college. They were not in the labor force. All were sitting at home, <coughs> possibly looking for jobs, but not explicitly expressing them looking for jobs. If you look at the gender difference, more than 13 percent of men and 55.3 percent young women were neat. Now 55.3. Women sitting at home doing nothing is a waste of the labor force in terms of pure economic value. If these people were to work, things would, be in, uh, would have been different. No, they're not working. Neat youth increased by 27 odd percent of the population in <clears throat> the period uh, 2004 5 to 33 percent in, in, in now, that is almost now. So we have a neat trend which is increasing. Uh, and neat youth it be 70 million to 125 million. Now, what does this show? If you look at countries like China, for example, South Korea, for example, there are trends which show that neat people come down, people are pulled into the labor force as the growth of the economy happens. And when people are pulled in, initially, all the men starts, uh, start working and then the women start getting trained. I mean, that's the unfortunate. The women start getting trained later, <coughs> but then the women join the labor force, and uh, the labor force participation, if you look at most of the developed countries, is 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 very high, with women touching almost forty five to fifty percent. But here the trend is different; people are withdrawing. So, if many of these need were to join the labor force, they would push up the GDP if the demographic trend were to happen which Santosh has been saying that, yeah, we are in a period of demographic trend, uh, demographic trend but demographic trend is not happening. And if this does not happen, open unemployment will, will further increase. So in the face of not having any job, people just sit. <clears throat> now we see this uh, uh, as a, you know, the need to be a kind of a disguised unemployment situation. And if this added to it, then the extent of Workers not working, but could possibly work to push up the GDP. Can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> now let's talk about the data. Annual pop uh, uh, annual growth in the population is 1.2 percent. Labor force 1.07 over this 20-year period. <clears throat> and between 12 and 19, it works out to be near zero, which I think uh, Santosh works out to be slightly negative, but well, that's obvious. The population of those by about 23% in the in the said period, 20 uh, between 4, 5 and uh, 18, 19, uh, though the workers rose only by about 8.3%, uh, which, which essentially, uh, you know, says what the data has said so far. And the female labor force has fallen. Uh, and I've just talked about this U-shaped form that in most countries in, in East Asia. Initially, the labor force of women has gone down, but then as the economies have grown further, they have started to join the labor force again. But in India, we have waited for far too long and nobody seems to be, no, these women don't seem to be joining. Next one, please. <coughs> now, we have a situation of increasing capital intensity and modernization in agriculture, which is evident from the fact that the number of tractors in this country is now growing. And uh, uh, almost nowhere, at least in uh, mainland uh, India, I'm not talking about this, uh, there are no bullocks anymore. It's all tractors. And the tractors replace labor by one is to four virtually. So most of our uh, data from the cost of cultivation shows that the per unit requirement of uh, per unit means per land requirement of labor has significantly gone down in the last 20 years. <coughs> so non farm. Workers are not absorbing workers. The labor is being rejected by agriculture. Mm. Let's look at it this way. Women rejected from agriculture or not required in agriculture for a variety of reasons we've discussed, four broad varieties we've discussed, are not suited to work in non-farm activities. Now, if there are jobs, for example, in Surat, in Nasik, in Koibatur, where the industries are coming up, are and the jobs are generally 8,000 to 15,000 rupees a month, are women in Bihar and UP where there's surplus labor, are they <coughs> sufficiently qualified and willing to go single women, young, from 
say Muzaffarpur, Badayu, to go to Nasik and Coimbatore and start work. It's very unrealistic because the amounts are small. The social secure, <coughs> safety and security both are not there. The language problem is huge and the peer group is virtually absent. So these women generally withdraw because there are no options of <coughs> other than still than staying at home. So many of these people, uh, uh, debates which are happening as to why the women are not working anymore, it's pretty much obvious. They are not required in agriculture where they were initially working. Agriculture is next door to the house. And uh, they and uh, the job and jobs are being created in places far away from the, where they cannot go. So the supply is such that uh, they just cannot take up these jobs. So we are seeing a situation of labor redundancy. So this is something which is I'm underlying labor redundancy. Can we have the next one, please? Slide, please. <clears throat> I will not say very much about this, except for one, two I have already said. Uh, Mm, I'll come to, to the, the fourth point, a large number of persons and NEET. Now, NEET means they are dependent on incomes from those who are earning. So actually, the per capita disposable income goes down. Now, this has two implications. One is that <clears throat> there is poverty, of course, in many households, critical dependence on the earners' incomes. And the other is far more serious. What happens if this person is incapacitated, dies or, getting, or gets retired? Then there's a crisis in the household. And this crisis is something which brings destitution. So this, <clears throat> in, uh, this, uh, this reduction in labor force for a variety of reasons is, is really a serious worry, not only at the macro level, but also at the household level. But there are many implications of this, which we have seen from the literature, that, that unpaid children start working for subsistence. And we have seen all kinds of other activities happening, which are extremely undesirable. So we need a situation for promoting labor intensity. We need a situation of ensuring geographical mobility of female workers. And uh, we have to reduce labor redundancy. Can we go next, please? Now, these are some of the field findings which we have found from the co uh, from <clears throat> the surveys during the COVID period. Now, this is pretty much obvious. I will not read it because I just have about 10 minutes, seven minutes left with me that unemployment situation according to CMI has gone up to 23 to 25 percent. People have lost jobs, not got salaries. <clears throat> people in mega cities have suffered the worst because they here is where the migrant laborers were the maximum. Then the numbers say for themselves about 120 million persons were affected because uh, the government's director saying that wages should be paid and people should not be kicked out of the house, then should not be asked, etc. Not complied with. Even today they are not being complied with. <clears throat> And there were, I mean, the different percentages come out that people were people who are migrant, people who uh, did not work for a variety of reasons, then they were shut down, did not get this. Uh, there was a study by Afri, uh, uh, Farzana Afridi, who was to join us today. <coughs> She's found out that 91% uh, of the men did not get their back wages. Yet another survey says that uh, female domestic workers in, uh, in Delhi did not receive wages in large numbers, 68%. Uh, <clears throat> then there were problems like when they went back home, many of these workers are not welcome home because there were quarantine problems, there were problems of livelihood, there were problems of spaces, there were problems of, of water supply, there were problems of, uh, <coughs> of food. So all kinds of problems were there because of which many of these people were not welcome home. And uh, uh, as a result of which they were neither wanted here nor wanted there. So there was this situation which all of you have read. I have tried to compile about 20, 25 studies and uh, not 25, about 30, 35 studies, uh, which were quick studies from which I have tried to bring in this particular slide. 
if you want, I could give more, but there's not much time. You can have that extra piece. So we have a long-term solution. <clears throat> if persons cannot be employed because of their current situation, they, are, they will only get 10 to 20, 12,000 and they just cannot go elsewhere to work. We need to have greater allocations to our education system. And there are schemes, it's not that we don't have schemes for them. Uh, we have a large number of schemes, but my basic point is the following, that if the high school situation is bad, no further education will help. We are talking about CNC machines at computer, <coughs> A numerical control machines. We are talking about computers. We are talking about software development. All these trainings doesn't uh, cannot happen unless basic maths, basic language, and basic logic is taught. <clears throat> we cannot have training of seventh field people, seventh class people. Period. We need to have greater allocations for education. Second one is the quality must improve. We have seen situations, and I have myself evaluated some situations after coming back to India in 2015. For 15 years, I was uh, out. <coughs> we have evaluated this situation in India and abroad. We have seen that the private sector works in Southeast Asia. The private sector does not work in India. Here, politicians, sons and daughters, and sons-in-laws, and daughters-in-laws, in-laws and outlaws. Everybody starts opening schools. And they are one-room schools employing teachers who would teach every subject. So, <clears throat> and then they would uh, uh, provide degrees which mean nothing. So the government has to step in. It's the quality which, which has to be ensured. And the MNE system doesn't work because the MNE is done by the same set of people who are setting up these institutions. We need government institutions. And the third is closer coordination with the industry. Are we training people in what the industry wants? And then the R&D expenditure is fundamentally important. What we have in the R&D is 0.78% uh, of the GDP. While in China, they're spending 3 plus percent. In the United States, they're spending much more about twice that number. I think China is now 5% into, into the research and development. Nobody realizes how important the R&D is. Uh, in fact, I don't want to give you very many examples, except the fact that in the 1980s, we were still making TVs, the Queltrons and the Keltrons and such things. But, uh, and the Koreans had just started making, they were making third-rate televisions and third-rate VCRs. Today, if you start seeing the Korean products have captured virtually the world market at the cost of even companies like Sony, because they invested very heavily into R&D and product development. This, and our industry has virtually stopped. We started railways in 1853, and we are still importing products from Japan. Korea started railways in 1940s, 30s, and 40s. They are exporting railway products. China started in the 1970s. They are competing in the international market as far as railways are concerned. So R&D is, is fundamental. Next one, please. <laughs> we have non-farm strategies, and here's a paper which uh, Santosh and I had written, uh, also written in, in popular medium. Uh, we need strategies to enable enterprises to scale up their operations. In fact, we have seen operations in Cambodia, Laos, Bangladesh, etc., where government factories are employing up to five to 6,000 workers. We have a small-scale industry policy. To whose benefit? <coughs> to nobody's benefit, because the, that, uh, because the mortality rate of small-scale industries is 25 to 28 percent, which we found when I was working with the ILO a long time back. <coughs> so we have a situation where we need to have a clear policy with regard to strategies in regard to size. Then we need to have indus functional industrial clusters, which I which I believe is a long-term topic. Santosh might talk about it. And then predictable taxation structure is. It's fundamentally important. We have a situation where court cases are going on even before the foreign capital has started effectively coming in on a regular basis. At least two major court cases. Are going on. <clears throat> then we need to have structure, infrastructure. For a long time, people said people should go where the jobs are. But I would reverse the situation and say jobs should go where the people are because in this dense situation of 500 persons, 450 persons per square kilometer, people cannot move to make Bombay's into Mega, mega Bombay's. Bombay already three crores. We can't make it six crores. Delhi's already two plus crores. We cannot make it. Then again, we need private sector initiative. I had said about research and development from the government. Please go back. I had said about uh, <coughs> uh, 
general research and development. Here I talk about private sector initiative. In Korea, for example, there are initiatives given, there are incentives given to the private sector to invest in the product development. Daiwu, for example, was earlier given uh, <coughs> a major in incentive by the government to develop the product. We have no such incentives in this country. The private sector needs to have this in initi initiative in instilled through uh, incentive from the government and else. Next one, please. <coughs> Next, one, yeah. This is something where I have again talked about. Uh, this is a TFR that means total fertility rate. Now our TFR is is pretty much high. It's it's about two point two even now, which is slightly uh, more than replacement. While most countries which have developed have had a TFR which was less than two, which means less than replacement even in the eighties and nineties. Korea, Japan, Taiwan. Think of countries, I mean, at least I can name 10 to 20 countries which have industrialized. They had, before the industrialization took off in a big way, the TFR had stabilized. What it means is basically that once you have a smaller family, then the women are released for both education. The girls are released for education. The women are released for labor force. And then the demographic uh, dividend starts taking shape. <clears throat> but if... The families are not small, then the women are stuck into other household, the per capita income is low, and the uh, level of learning in the household is, is equally as, as low. So as a result, what happens is that the overall system is, is uh, not an earning system, but a subsistence system. So this is something which needs to be taken into account. The next one, please. Now, immediate, what do we do? I think the government initiative here is, is very important. Those workers who wish to stay back, food security and income security, housing for them are fundamental. So this is something which has been talked about but never done. Employers must pay <coughs> workers, uh, temporary workers, to persuasions and campaigns. Well, we've had fights between the state and the central governments uh, in many places, but the sufferer has, has been the worker. Uh, this this needs to be worked out with partnership with the trade unions, the NGOs, civil society, etc. <clears throat> Those who wish to go back, food security and income support again needs to be <clears throat> ensured along with transport. We had transports starting in August. <clears throat> While the first lockdown came in March, people were walking a thousand miles. That's that's not uh, you know shining India. We haven't used information channels, especially e-channels, which, which is paramount for a situation like this. And finally, I would say it's never too late to register unregistered workers. I remember one incident. I was a part of a Niti Aayog meeting. That's not going to be details about course. And one of the senior officers asked, we want to know the numbers of how many people are there in Delhi who are migrant workers. And there was nobody who could answer that. Why can't workers who are coming in be registered? Why should there be a, a problem in registering? It's not an expensive process. We have an Aadhaar <clears throat> system. So based on Aadhaar, this could easily be uh, found out and a database maintains that those who are migrant, those who are permanent, those who have housing, management of this can be, uh, can be done. Workers' rights must be upheld and their dignity not compromised. I think, can we go to the last one now? Yeah, so that's about it. I think I will I will stop at that. And uh, since I've taken 35 minutes, I think uh, I'll hand it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sarthi. Uh, very useful. A lot of very interesting points. I'm sure there's plenty of ground for a lot of uh, interesting comments back from... Uh, First, Dr. Radhika Kapoor and then Dr. Vifandi Ari. Radhika, floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Narotra. Uh, thank you, Impri, for inviting me uh, to be a discussant to this talk. And thank you, Professor Acharya, for an uh, excellent talk. I think you very lucidly outlined that the employment problem, you know, both of unemployment and underemployment, uh, is, is not a recent phenomenon because so much of the current debate has focused on what has happened post-pandemic. But it's quite clear 
that uh, you know this is a crisis that has been brewing in India for a very very long time, and the pandemic has only exacerbated the severity of that crisis. And therefore, you know, we need a very coherent action plan to deal with this crisis. And uh, also what's important is that when we're developing that coherent action plan, we have clarity in terms of what we need to do in the long term, uh, long to medium term, and what we need to do in the immediate term. So it's very nice that you actually um, uh, decomposed your policy recommendations into what needs to be done immediately and what needs to be done in the long term. Uh, what I was particularly happy with when I saw your presentation was that this was set in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and uh, you know, which talks about decent work parole and productive employment parole. Now, of course, the conversation on employment in India is is largely dominated by the issue of quantity, as you know, where are all the jobs and the numbers of the jobs. Uh, but equally important, and particularly in the light of the SDG, is also what is the quality of employment and what does that uh, scenario look like? So I'm going to touch a little bit on that. And I had a slide. And if I can request Dr. Kumar to put it up. Yeah, so you can just go to the next slide. And, you know, you've already outlined many of these figures where you show the decomposition of the workforce into the several different categories of workers. Uh, in India. And, uh, you know, as, as we know that about 75% uh, of the workforce is either self-employed or it's in casual work. So they're outside the ambit of uh, standard employer-employee relationships. And just about 25%, uh, this, by the way, is uh, the most recent periodic labor force survey data, 2018-19. So the regular wage salaried workers are just about one-fourth of total employment in India. Uh, so if you were to sort of rank workers, uh, or rank employment in India into a hierarchical order, I think it would be reasonable to assume that the casual workers are at the bottom, the self-employed are a bit better off. And here I'm saying they're a bit better off because as you can see, the self-employed category is largely dominated by own account workers and unpaid family workers. The employers uh, were, you know, the, the, the sort of dynamic entrepreneurs who are probably generating jobs for others are uh, few and far between. So you have casual workers at the bottom, you have self-employed somewhere in the middle, and the relatively better jobs are regular wage salary jobs. Now, what do you call a good job? What is the idea of decent work, productive employment? Uh, now, one would imagine that a good job is one that is associated with a reasonable security of tenure. It's also one that provides you access um, to all possible social security benefits that are available. Now, in India, we have a definition of formal employment, which basically says that if you have access to even one social security benefit, you get qualified as a formal worker. And that's a fairly relaxed definition of what constitutes formal employment. So if you look at this category of regular wage salary workers in India, which is 24% of total employment, uh, <coughs> is just about 60% of these regular wage salary workers have access to at least one social security benefit. So that amounts to just about 9.6% of total employment in India. But if you were to use a slightly more stringent criteria of what constitutes a formal job and say, let's define a formal job as one which provides access to more social security benefits, such as EPF, pension, gratuity, maternity benefits, and so on, all the um, schemes which are captured in the PLFS data, you would find that that number, the share of uh, of regular salaried workers who actually have access to those benefits is just 18%. And that amounts to just a little over 4% of the total workforce. Now, if you add one uh, to this and to look at what a good job is and say, what is the percentage of your workforce which has a job that gives them security of tenure? So say the, the, secure, the contract duration is for more than three years and they have access to all social security benefits, that's over 2% of total employment in India. So if that's decent work and that's a good quality job, then we are doing absolutely miserably. And if I go back to the previous NSS surveys, 2004, 5, 11, 12, and I look at these numbers, the statistics really don't change. Uh, you know, the, the category that I marked in red, that still fluctuates anywhere between 2 and 3%. So even in periods where India has witnessed spectacular economic growth, not only have we not witnessed commensurate increase in employment, but I think the quality of employment 
also leaves um, a lot to be desired. And therefore, in terms of policy recommendations, we also need to think about how we can improve uh, the quality of employment, in particular access to social security benefits. And I'm sure that's something which will be a topic of discussion later as well, given that we have Professor Merutra here who's worked extensively uh, on this issue. But I think broadly, you know, the question is that having these good jobs and decent work is a positive externality for society. The question is who needs to bear the cost of creating these good jobs? In some ways, you know, the firms, the employers, they underestimate the value of these good jobs. So how do we step in and actually enhance creation of these good jobs? The second aspect that I wanna highlight, uh, Ajit, you can go to the next slide, is basically, you know, we, we say that India just doesn't have a jobs problem. It also has a wages, wages problem. And again, the issue of wages in your earnings is linked to the quality of employment which has been generated. And here, what I'm, I'm showing you is basically the three different categories of employment which are reported in the household surveys. Uh, what, what does the earning structure there look like? Now, about two, three years ago, there was a committee which was formed um, to determine a national minimum wage. And they had recommended a national minimum wage of 375 rupees a day or 9,750 rupees a month. Uh, and, and they said that this is basically, you know, a, a basic minimum that people uh, should be receiving. But if you, and, and this um, was, I think, 2018. So if you actually now look at the share of workers who are earning above uh, this nas uh, recommended national minimum wage across the various categories of employment in India, you find that that, uh, is, that number is actually quite small. I mean, it's, it's given separately for regular wage salaried workers. Uh, where, you know, 42% of regular wage salary workers are still earning below uh, the, the nationally recommended minimum wage. Uh, in the case of casual workers, 92% of workers are earning below that. And for the self-employed, about 57% are earning below that minimum wage. So again, there is the question of how can we solve this wages problem? Because in the organized sector, the wages that people get are relatively higher. They're actually, in most cases, higher than the wages that you see here. Uh, but most of the workforce is in the unorganized sector. So how do you enhance wages in the unorganized sector is, is another issue that we should probably discuss. Uh, because essentially, you know, the employment and the wages problem has fed into a demand problem in the Indian economy. And we know that that demand problem has again been brewing before the pandemic and it has exacerbated post pandemic. Uh, so the question of both, you know, the quality of employment vis-a-vis -vis wages and vis-a-vis -vis access to social security or security of tenure has been miserable even before the pandemic. And we know that this is going to worsen even further. In fact, it may well be the case that informality is going to rise uh, in the years to come. And there are also going to be new forms of employment <clears throat> about gig work. Uh, and, and in many ways, that's just a new form of informal employment with the platform uh, de depriving workers of social security benefits. Although the code does talk about giving social security benefits to gig workers. So what I wanted to highlight here was, and I was, therefore I was very happy that you put this discussion in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, especially Sustainable Development Goal 8, which talks about productive employment and full employ and decent employment. Uh, but also, you know, here it's interestingly linked. They've put in sustained and inclusive growth with the idea of productive employment. <clears throat> now, when you lay out your policy recommendations, which are, you know, absolutely spot on. Uh, just to step back and reflect uh, on it in the context of these goals, you know, we have this increasingly, we've been hearing this, that if we have higher growth, we're going to create more jobs. And it's the maximization of GDP, the maximization of GDP growth rate, which takes center stage, because we assume that if that happens, then jobs are going to be created. But as you've demonstrated in your presentation, it's clear that that doesn't have to happen. So we need to sort of reflect back on our growth and development strategy and understand, you know, what is the sectoral composition of growth that can actually give us the maximum bang for our buck and create more jobs. Like you pointed out that basically the workers who are exiting agriculture have ended up in the construction sector. Now, earnings in the construction sector are pretty low. Quality of employment uh, is, is also quite poor because about 80% 
of workers who are in construction are actually in casual work. Um, and then, you know, the high growth rates have essentially been driven by high-end services, which don't generate jobs for the kind of people who are exiting the agricultural sector. So rethinking the growth and development strategy, where you actually emphasize on those sectors which will create employment for those at the bottom of the distribution uh, is really quite critical. And, um, and I think that's, that's what you were alluding to when you were talking about the idea of labor redundancy and enhancing labor intensity. Uh, so, so I think that it was, um, that was again spot on. And essentially the nature of the growth process has to be such that it creates job opportunities for those people who are at the bottom, because it's only then that growth will be inclusive and create decent and better employment. So I'm gonna stop here for now and perhaps come in later again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Radhika. And here is a speaker who has uh, been on leave for the last year. And you've churned out all this work, Radhika. Good job. Sandhya, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think uh, it's very refreshing to see labor back on the table once again. And in fact, coming back with real questions uh, with evidence, which is absolutely critical for the few, uh, few the, for the pattern in which India needs to talk about uh, its own developmental conundrums. Um, uh, I have sent the PPT. Will you be able to share, Dr. Arjun, or has it reached you? I will it's do that. Just a few slides, uh, Professor Mehrotra. I won't take too long. No, no, I please. thought it becomes easier for us to look at issues that uh, Professor Sarthi Acharya has raised. And I think these are the disturbing questions uh, we need to keep talking about and have a serious uh, focus on too. So Sarthi um, was very, like very, very disciplined. So you, he's opened up a lot of time for discussion. <laughs> Please go ahead. Absolutely. I think that's the beauty of it. Uh, so basically, I think what today's talk has done is it has really rekindled a very crucial issue about the pathways India has adopted since <clears throat> the economic reforms. I think the story is not even a 2004 problem for me. I think it started way back in 91 when, when I don't think we have prepared ourselves for the unemployment issues at all. And the rich data analysis uh, that Professor Acharya has uh, done and uh, has shared with us demonstrates how systematically we have been incapable in aligning the economic sectors to absorb the labor force and the ever expanding labor force. I remember when we uh, announced the reforms, uh, we were ha absolutely jubilant about the knowledge driven expansion, the possible demographic dividend that we are going to be experiencing. Uh, Dr. Arjun, can you just, uh, did you get the presentation? Is it possible for you to look at it? Uh, yeah. Just... yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, hullabaloo about uh, the map pattern in which, uh, you know, India is going to be the next major uh, uh, geography from where growth is going to take place. But when you look at the story that Professor Acharya has shared with us is absolutely disturbing about how can we be so unprepared for the transformation that should have been the point of change for us. Um, having said that, I think, uh, can you go to the next slide straight away so that I come to the issues. Uh, I think what we uh, see over here is that uh, the paper and the presentation today sh shows that there's a structural shift of the labor market. There seems to be a sharp reduction in part-time employment and casual workers. For those who look at clinically this particular change, they would assume that we are moving towards a decent work arena, perhaps. But as rightly, uh, you know, argued out, uh, there seems to be a problem over here. Uh, it has not really translated to increased standard of living. And uh, as Dr. Radhika has already highlighted the wage conundrums and issues related to wage inequalities in India, I would like to only substantiate it further with the fact that unemployment rates continue to be very high. Uh, the full-time workers do not reflect uh, the kind of wages that are earned by them. Uh, I think we have to be a little uh, mindful, Professor Acharya, over here where NSSO itself redefined the, uh, the indicator of regular workers in its surveys to represent all workers who are working full-time in any organization whether they are working as casual workers, if they're working for about eight to 10 hours, they were marked as regular. Now, earlier regular workers were salaried class. The indicator of salaried class suddenly seems to have gone out of the NSS service. They're being clubbed together. So if they are seeing that there's a rise in full-time uh, uh, workers, it only implies that we are clubbing, uh, you know, uh, oranges and apples together to aggregate the figure. And perhaps there are many more poor workers and precarious working conditions in which 
people are employed for longer durations. And this has serious implications for in terms of how many workers, I think uh, KP Kannan and others have given us uh, the precarious wage poverty and the poverty among the working class quite well, indicating that wages and social securities are not guaranteed for a large number of full-time workers in India. So being full-time does not guarantee them uh, decent work. The issue which also becomes very interesting is that the Niti Aayog report, uh, SDG 2021, uh, states that about 10 states seem to have been performing in achievers category of decent work yeah. SDG, which means that at least doing and going the right direction. But when we go to the next SDG, which is industry, innovation and infrastructure, it's only six. So among the various states which seem to be, and I think where Radhika was talking about sectoral uh, engines, which are the states which are really the engines for India's transformation? I think we need to go from national to the subnational level. I think uh, this is where the story comes in. When we see talk about migrants, when we talk about workers going from urban to rural areas, we clearly know some regions just don't have an idea of what's going to come to them in the post-pandemic reality. Uh, Dr. Arjun, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, I think what was fascinating to and uh, very important for me when I heard the, the presentation is that we seem to be having a perennial problem in <clears> India <throat> of the missing secondary sector. The very fact that workers from agriculture today are getting absorbed in the urban construction sector and the services sector means we just don't, uh, we are just not getting our ideas right. How can a labor abundant economy not have a manufacturing sector policy in place? And even within the manufacturing sector, we seem to be adopting a very piecemeal approach. Uh, we know that we are dominant in the micro and small scale enterprise. We know that the organized sector continues to be dominated by the PSUs. Again, there's no private sector, very little. We can, I think uh, Professor Santosh Mehrotra has given that a number of his papers too. So the private sector in India continues to be the tail wagging behind the race of economic progress. So do we really have anything to state about what should the private sector's position be? Can we talk about a rewiring? Because I think Professor Acharya, uh, there seems to be a complete piecemeal sectoral understanding of labor market in India. We are not really trying to understand that the value chain within India is broken down and that there's no forward or backward linkage in any ideation that seems to be taking in. I think uh, your inputs on uh, one of these issues would be very, very crucial as to how do you see it coming in. Uh, Dr. Arjun, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, the last but not the least, I think um, what is the, uh, the post-COVID-19 pandemic looking like? It's the Anthropocene space. We are going to be living in crisis and pandemics continuously. We have been talking about work from home, work at home, everything around the work, but without the worker in mind. Do we really have a strategy in place? And I think what Mehboob speak had given told way back in 1990s needs to come on the table. We need to talk about joint up action. But in the economic sector in India, we are continuously trying to talk about incentives for the capital sector, for capital intensive incentivizing production processes, technology. We may still adopt what the Western world talks <laughs> about digitization, robotics. And I think even the new education policy talks about how every child in school needs to learn artificial intelligence, even if it can't read and write. I think there seems to be a fundamental problem. And when I uh, looked at the data set on NEET, I was alarmed that there are so many educated youth who have benefited from Sarva Siksha Abhyan, but we don't know how are they going to get absorbed. And then by 2030, new education policy will be implemented and many more youth in general, women in particular. And for me, the problem of SCs and STs becomes more important. Do we have any idea about how we are going to look at the entire employment policy, keeping the vulnerable groups in mind, vulnerable regions, and the sectors where they are being employed? There's a lot of data of how workers from the vulnerable class and class are continuously getting marginalized, and we still have these practices being implemented in the micro enterprises. Do we, with the introduction of the alternate sectors such as renewable energy, sectoral uh, strategies, today morning I was in another meeting where I get to know from the industries that they do not have electrical engineers who can support the renewable energy and the electron EV segments. And our engineering sector is the last prepared to address this problem. Are we going to import labor for this or are we going to import technology? Are we losing out the chance once again? 
And I think what COVID-19 has done is it's begged borrow and steal when it comes to intellectual property rights. With the, st with the sharp, uh, uh, visible understanding of what uh, the entire vaccination drive has done to India is we did not align the IPR of the industrial developmental agenda setting. We do not have standards in place. And the employment challenge continues to be placed in a template of the 1990s, where if there's no job, give them social <clears throat> security. If they don't have skills, take them, teach them weaving and basket making, but refuse to treat them as mature contributors to growth. Dr. Raju, take me to the last slide, please. So are we really measuring work or workers is the last question I had, Dr. Acharya. Our existing measures or surveys that we have been talking about constantly are only talking about strict categories, which was started in the 1970s. I think you and I have discussed a lot on these issues. Have we transformed our methodologies for the 21st century? Where we have gig workers, we have workers working in multiple sectors, which are just not accounted. We have NIC codes updated, but not work. So are we really understanding the question well with a, when it comes to workers? We may talk about indicators such as bring in Aadhaar cards, ESIS cards, PAN cards, so on and so forth. We still look at workers as migrants who are struggling for domicile, identity, and work rather than human beings who are, whom we value or whom we want to nurture as creating wealth and value in the economic progress. I think, Professor Acharya, what I would want to understand from you is what can be the new methods that we can look at in terms of re at least revisiting as labor economists for understanding the question of jobs, workers, and more centrally, the notion of what is our idea of development for workers. I think we need to keep workers in the center. Thank you so much, Dr. Raju. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Sandhya. Um, very useful comments indeed. And San Sarthi has uh, much to chew upon here. Um, I want some guidance from you, Arjun, as to what time do you want to finish the webinar? Uh, because we want to obviously have a question and answer session. We want to give uh, Sarthi a chance to respond, and then I might make three or four comments briefly as we close. Time uh, is not an issue, uh, uh, as much as you have said. It's not very strict for timing. So Okay. Fine, fine. And we also have uh, Professor Sita Prabhu, ma'am. So maybe if she wants, she can also speak later. Indeed, uh, indeed. I want to ask a question, but sir, after you, yes. Right. No, no. I have not. I, I'm not speaking just now. I, the floor is open, mm -hmm. and since you mentioned Dr. Sita Prabhu, uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome, Sita Prabhu. Please, uh, please. Uh, oh, we want to see you. Wonderful. It's so good to see you after such a long time. And we also have Dr. Joe's there, and we would like to listen to Dr. Joe's. Yes. But uh, Dr. Joe's uh, went to talk to uh, her daughter, some long distance call, but he's watching on Facebook Live. I will connect with him. Sita, ma'am, can you hear us? If you can unmute, ma'am. If you can unmute. unmute Sita, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I was so keen on listening to all of you and wonderful uh, you know, points that everyone made. I was only uh, saying that you brought out so clearly the dualism that it, uh, exists in the economy and that now reflects in the labor market as well. And how long will we go ahead with this uh, dualistic mode, in a sense, of this large mass of uh, you know, uneducated, unskilled workers, uh, low earning, and with a small uh, sort of island of uh, highly skilled educated and high earning individuals. So this type of inequality is going to really ruin the country before anything else. What I would like to ask is if there is a uh, interim policy, I mean, it's true that we need to improve the quality of education, increase the allocations, etc. But in the interim, can we think of some skill? I mean, I know that Professor Sardi Acharya in his very comprehensive uh, you know, presentation could not deal you know, adequately with the skilling issues. Maybe we have something to talk about the skills and how in the short run we are in a position to bridge this because the demographic dividend that we relied on so much has been wasted and it's only concentrated only in a few states that are low income and uh, you know low human development as it were the state. We know all of uh, which those are. So in such a situation, what role does skill development play? And also the skill development will have to be rethought. We can't be just 
you know, the standard ones and women particularly, you can't give them only pickle making, carpet making and stuff like that. So how do we absorb the women into the uh, workforce? Bangladesh has, you know, 50% and Sri Lanka has 35% women working in the sectors, uh, in uh, manufacturing and in uh, work. Apart from the fact, I mean, we cannot talk about women in work without talking about the unpaid work that they do and the burden of unpaid work that is increasing because of the COVID pandemic, the care work and so on. Uh, so I think this complex set of issues, firstly, specifically, I would like to know about the uh, skill uh, training issues and how do we reimagine uh, the skilling issue and so that intermediate after 10 or 12 that we create a range of jobs, both in the rural mm. and urban sectors, where the semi-trained or uh, uh, secondary school educated youth can be absorbed to a greater extent in these new jobs that will have to emerge in food processing, maybe maintenance jobs and so on. And second, how do we get our women to participate on a greater, uh, on a more equal footing in the economic uh, sector, I mean, how do we do that? Is self-help group the only thing for women or do we have something that can help them you know, more concretely? Do women have to help themselves? I mean, self-help group is basically say that you help yourself, we can't do anything about it. Or is there a policy that we can think of? Thank you. Thank you, Sita. Okay, let's open it up uh, to a broader participation, who would like to uh, ask a question? You know, what would be really welcome is questions, sharply targeted questions, as opposed to, uh, you know, comments. Anyone like to, yeah. Yes, yeah, sir, I would like to ask you a question. Please, 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 Arjun. Uh, the number one question was that, uh, as uh, Professor Acharya also highlighted that, so you have been also mentioning that the rate of the labor force is constant from last one decade. And as we know, uh, how many class 10th and class 12th students are joining or passing, the NEET issue is really coming out from there. Uh, what, what is the view of Professor Sarthi Acharya? And also, our census number is now sort of due and postponed. <clears throat> how do you see this conundrum? And uh, sir, at the start only, you mentioned that uh, in other South uh, East Asian countries and other places, employment is really a political issue. Why is it not a political issue time and again in India? in your view, comparative. And uh, in terms of the policies or levers we have still in India, there are no dearth of policy, very good policies and scheme. Uh, but so do you think, minim as, as Radhika Ma'am was highlighting, the issue of minimum wage, will it solve anything? Because at the ministry and minister's office, I have also seen trade unions and uh, industries, other people also fighting that uh, this minimum wage is also very high. So, you know, that's also a conundrum that we should not have this minimum wage. So how should we move forward? And as uh, uh, Sita Ma'am was also highlighting that whether self-help groups will be the way forward. And in terms of policy, do you think empl uh, national employment policy or industrial policy would have anything? Uh, one, one more thing, uh, uh, Professor Sita Ma'am really highlighted and also uh, Sita Ma was that there is a lot of uh, inequality or uh, 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 not convergence uh, 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 between the states. And that is why also the migration issue is coming upon. And how do you think that uh, we can solve these issues? Uh, do we need to really have state specific policies or schemes or that sort of development? Uh, because it's really the labor becoming a concurrent issue and no laborers, how to move forward in that. And uh, uh, I would reiterate the question of again, what uh, Sita Ma'am asked, how to solve this very important problem of uh, female employment, underemployment, and not participation in the workforce. So uh, with that, Sarsi, sir, would you like to take this? I will collect other questions till then. Well, if the chairman says yes, I will speak. Yes, I will. yes. <laughs> yes <laughs> Professor Acharya, of course you have the floor. Well, thanks, Sandosh. Well, a number of issues have come up. Very interesting, I think, starting with Radhika, who had said, quality is important. Yes, quality is fundamental. How do you bring about quality without having the quality of our labor force good enough? The top labor force, unfortunately, skims off every year abroad. 90% of the people, the best, the best. 
uh, we have people who are left behind, a large number of IITs and doctors join the civil services. How many of the good people stay into engineering, into R&D, and into companies where it matters? Now, look, look at it this way. I looked at the startups in India and startups in China. The startups in China were in telecom, electronics, uh, into artificial intelligence and such things. Our startups in India are fifth part, basically cell shops, Facebook types of communication, exchange. So don't add value as artificial intelligence or companies like Alibaba does. So we have a situation of where the energies are going. So if you're interested in technology, I think the long-term issue is that unless the schooling is addressed, the Sita said, how do you do it? Unless the schooling is addressed, I don't think we can do much. Uh, we'll have to live with this. We've lived 2,000 years as a poor country, uh, irrespective of what Shashi Thalur says. We'll continue to do that unless we, unless we improve the quality of uh, the overall population. <clears throat> the short term skills, six months, one year, are not going to help. So, this dualism is something which will converge only when tightening of the labor market situation happens, which Sita was talking about. Now, center of the whole thing is that we have no policy in this country. We have only ad hoc reactions to this. And in fact, we have been talking about much earlier than me, Santosh has been talking about it. We have written together on this subject. Why don't we have an industrial policy for the last 30 years? We've followed World Bank, IMF thing, do away with policy, policy and let the market decide. But market will work at best when we have equal partners, the game theory uh, very clearly says you can't have unequal partners and expect equal results. This is what is currently happening. We don't have equal partners. We have landless laborers and Ambani's. I mean, they actually interact in such a way that we have a second best, third best, fourth best to some kind of a solution. We don't have a situation like that. So we need a policy. We need a policy of what earlier uh, uh, Sandhya was talking about. What, what do we do about the private sector? Why is it not taking lead? It's not taking lead because we don't have a policy in place. We don't have an industry policy which will do what, for example, South Korea did. In fact, I, I clearly noticed that about two decades back, there was this big company called Daewoo. It's manufacturing cars, which is manufacturing ships, the works. It went bust because it went borrowed too much to pay. What the South Korean government, a very, very capitalist government, what it does was did was take over the company, slice it. Even India got its share in, in Tata's buying their trucks division. <coughs> Cars were bought by General Motors. They sliced off the company, sold it off, took the debts, created a, a, a special purposes vehicle, put the debts there, <coughs> and saw that the country does not suffer because of a non large. Do we have a policy like that? Have we done anything in any any uh, uh, industry of the, uh, uh, in India of that kind? <clears throat> we have a serious problem in regard. To the third thing is again this is this is this uh, following what uh, Sandhya had said. We need a new statistical system. Let me give you an example. Uh, we have changed the statistical system very much since 1871 when the British started. Some tickling here and there improvement. But margin, but it's incremental improvement. There's no major change. And I'm a part of a committee which uh, which is looking at employment created by various occupations. So it's a Ministry of Labor initiative which I have uh, been associated with. And the more we talk about changes and alternatives and looking differently, the more the IES and the ISS officers look back at the NSS saying, "But ऐसा तो नहीं हो सकता है. अरे भाई क्यों नहीं हो सकता है? ऐसा नहीं हो सकता है." So they'll go back to the old format and after six meetings and spending hundreds of thousands of rupees, they'll come up with that NSS format which changes in, uh, you know, it's done electronically now. So it looks beautiful, but it's, it's more of the same. So somehow if we, have to, if we have to change the statistical system, we have to change the kind of a thinking which the government does. And that, that you've been in the government, you know how the government functions. It functions through files, through processes, through hierarchies. Can we have this differently. And don't tell me that the private sector will do it better. Our private sector is doing better. We need to have definitive policies and implementation processes in place which will make things happen. <laughs> Finally, I would say only one thing. <clears throat> what do we do immediately which Sita was talking about? We don't, we always think of going to space. We think about going to the moon and compete. Why don't we talk about clothes, garments, shoes, furniture, 
labor, other labor intensive industries, electricals, electronics, <coughs> alternative forms of energy, which could all utilize and alternative forms in agriculture, which could all effectively utilize labor on a sustainable basis. And this is just a small list of clothes garment. So we, what, uh, we have a, uh, an export of something like what, 20 to 30 billion dollars of export. China is 110. So these are numbers which speak for themselves. Bangladesh is taking over India in, in garments and exports. These are the ones which will create jobs at the lower ends. <coughs> Unfortunately, at least in one experiment, I would say this was happening through an initiative in a private sector where, where in a way I was involved. The company was told by the government, give the money to the PM care, you forget about these sectors. We will take care. You don't know where the money is gone. So these kinds of things should be encouraged rather than be discouraged to over centralization. And we need a definitive policy which will have a vision of at least 10 years. I think I'll stop there because uh, I think then there are others who would like to speak. Okay, the floor is open again. Who, who would want to ask more questions? There is uh, one question has come from uh, Surekha Talariji. Thank you for the wonderful insights for a common person like me. The gap of government policies and practices is obviously there. I'm just wondering what might be the grand plan of government itself when they are bringing these kind of economic policies? I mean, what are they heading toward as they have their own economic advisor? Uh, I know it is quite a broad question, but still, thank you a lot. So, uh, Sarthi said this question is really coming again and again. Even common person, technical persons also are not able to understand it. And it becomes a, a, an issue time and again, but we are still stuck to uh, uh, Manrega and other things, especially and our growth strategy or beat our employment policy not going forward. So, what would you like to tell to a you know, general mass about this problem and the state of employment in India? Well, I would like to give a sequence here, whether it was Chidambaram, Sargudam Rajan, Subramaniam, the, the current Subramaniam, what's his name? Uh, Chris. Chris. Huh? Chris. Chris. There's a sequence of people. They only talk about monetary policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy. What about a growth policy? What about, only talking about the monetary sector <coughs> and not talking about the real sector. Nobody is talking about the fact, how do you generate, how do you, let's say, revive the textile sector, the garment sector, and promote a value-added growth process. That's not the question they're asking. They're asking how much to reduce interest rate by 0 0.7 uh, EPS or no. questions like <coughs> the government going to monetary spending, or should have should it have a fiscal space created through excess taxation or here and there? That's not something which is which everybody is raising the same thing. And as far as jobs are concerned, even <coughs> top economists, I mean, who have mattered in this country, have talked about, oh, there are jobs created in Narega. Put in more money in Narega. That means even after 70 years, we are digging holes. <laughs> through a fiscal process. Do we have a thinker in the government who thinks about a consolidated, integrated government policy? See, if nothing else, SDGs until uh, a defined period. If no, then uh, you have the answers. Okay, Sati going on painting a grimmer and grimmer picture any further questions one more one more further question please, uh, please. so what do you think about the the i would not say universal basic income but the cash transfers because many state governments have very much uh, jharkhand uh, maharashtra tamil nadu for women also uh, uh, unaccounted care work for, that is also coming and during this pandemic delhi government <laughs> 5,000. How do you see this phenomenon going on uh, further and uh, would it resolve any situation? Well, to me, uh, universal basic income is not very different from an Erega kind of a scheme. It's to give you money. And uh, about two years back, I think there was a seminar organized by the IHT along with, uh, well, there were people like Pana Bardhan who had flown down from, from the United States. Uh, and there was uh, Joshi who came in from the UK. And they all talked about having uh, a system of uh, 
universal cash transfer, conditional and unconditional. And strangely enough, they said India does not have a system where we can target the cash properly. So give money to everybody, whether it's Ambani, Tata, or it is a rent I mean, that's the kind of a, a, a system if, if we have. I have a cash transfer, <coughs> give 500 rupees to everybody. So it's not going to change the situation. To me, that's not a solution at all. Go ahead. Okay. So, any further questions? No, sir. We can stop there. I would, uh, sir, if you want to go, you can go. Or otherwise, I will uh, uh, invite Radhika, ma'am, or Sindhya, ma'am, if they have any query. <coughs> I would like to add. Sir? Radhika? Sandhya? Hmm. A very interesting discussion. Just a very, uh, just some very few comments. One is we've had this discussion about the statistical system and we've been having it now for a very long time. Uh, what are all the flaws that are there in the statistical system? Uh, and, and while I'm completely cognizant of all those, I think also we have to appreciate that we have a very large informal economy and uh, capturing what's going on in the informal economy is really quite challenging. And the NSS questionnaire, not the PLFS, but the NSS questionnaire was actually very exhaustive and did a pretty decent job of capturing all the complexities in the labor market. Uh, the PLFS questionnaire is shorter naturally because it has to be done annually. But I think if that exercise were to be supplemented with a quinquennial exercise where we go back to the same longer questionnaire of the NSS, that would be very useful. But having said this, you know, even I feel even the annual PLFS is not adequate because uh, we really have no high frequency statistics on employment. We are compared to rely on CMIE, which has its own share of problems, which I'm not going to delve into right now. But you know, everyone was talking about monetary policy, fiscal policy, growth policy, so on. There is no relationship between unemployment rate and monetary policy uh, in this country. I mean, I don't think the RBI looks at any kind of unemployment rate while deciding monetary policy. Uh, one is that we do need to have some sort of high frequency indicators. Um, for this to feed into the rest of the policy discourse, be it your monetary policy or fiscal policy. The second thing I want to say is that we actually need an employment policy. Uh, and that employment policy, the heart of it, as you know, uh, both Professor Acharya and Professor Mahirotra have been writing, is that you need an industrial policy. You need a policy that focuses on those sectors, which incentivizes those sectors that will create jobs for those who are at the bottom of the distribution, there's textiles, there's garments. And like Dr. Ayer mentioned, I mean, there is no talk of backward and forward linkages anymore. So we really have to go back to having a discussion on the production side uh, in the industrial sector and look at the whole domestic supply chain, say in apparel, and understand that why is it that we're not even being able to produce competitively like Bangladesh? I mean, is it a consequence of the import tariffs or what or so on? But we need that industrial policy and we need our trade policy to be aligned with industrial policy, again, as Professor Nerutra has highlighted uh, several times. And just one thing I want to add is that I don't personally see Narega as being a part of an employment policy. To me, Narega is like a safety net. Uh, and uh, I don't see people actually seeing it as a source of job creation because it's difficult manual work. It doesn't even pay you minimum wages because the Narega wage rate is... is schedule is kept separate from minimum wage. In fact, the new code on wages explicitly states that Narega wages will be outside that domain. So I think when we bring in Narega into this employment uh, policy discussion, it kind of muddies the water a bit. And then we go back to having that old discussion of how it's a uh, ditch digging exercise. But I think we need to appreciate its value as a safety net. And that has come through during the last one year. So I'm just going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me and Toshar, let me also add a few points to the statistics part. So, uh, yes, so agriculture, we have, you know, PMK San and other new statistics and for rural sector, Narega and other uh, is also there. For industries, we have annual survey of industry, fairly okay data and PLFS is coming. We, NSS also comes up with the uh, service uh, sector rounds. And uh, there we are also integrating MCA database uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, and that is also becoming uh, 
one of the frame for the surveys. Sir, how do you see that and the other real-time databases like ESIC, EPFO, GSTN, all those things are also coming. Our government has also uh, launched something called uh, PM Admir Bhar Bharat Rozgar Yojana, uh, PM Swanidhi for street vendors. So there are many points also coming. How do you see the, the statistics in, in all this totality? Or should we have high frequency data as Radhika ma'am was suggesting, uh, what RBI produces on monthly basis for various economic indices? Should, should labor bureau take that or a ministry take that? Some surveys are also going on for unorganized sector, but that will uh, really not be uh, periodic. I just wanted to mention all that, Professor Mehrotra. Uh, should we go to Sandhya now? Uh, Sandhya, please. Thank you so much. I think. Uh... We are getting into the web of a lot of issues. And I think, uh, you know, I, what uh, Dr. Radhika and Arjun have mentioned is that we are like in a ventilator condition in case of employment analysis. We'll keep running multiple diagnostic reports for the patient just to know whether he's going to recover at all or not. Very, when we know very clearly that we need to take action. And I think action in the last decade of SDGs means that we need to start placing labor in the center. That's the first point. And the second thing is, our country is the country which has the maximum number of engineers working on artificial intelligence and machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. But even now, we don't know how to create real-time big, big data in employment. We are still trying to look at in terms of you know, generating frequency indicators using survey methodologies. Assume that for the next one and a half years, we are going to be in COVID pandemic times. Are we going to be still waiting for data to come? You know, we need to become innovative. We need to start thinking seriously about our data systems and frameworks of doing the job. Uh, the third major thing, I think what Professor Acharya mentioned is so serious, is that uh, industrial development is one side of the problem, but the evidence which he's uh, also highlighted is the choice of the labor today. Labor is looking for work and wherever it is generated, he, he or she moves there. Today, labor has gone to the construction sector. Do we have an integrated industrial and construction policy at all in our country? When we went to Code Code in one of our analysis, we found a number of migrant workers working in the services sector in the big, uh, you know, real estate as well as the retail segments that are going on, the entire mall culture that has come up in the last 15 years. Do we have a policy for that? Are we trying to say, labor, you're not allowed to go there because I want you to be in the manufacturing sector? So the non-farm sector, the non-agricultural sector needs to be within the larger umbrella in which industrial analysis needs to be placed. We need to look at this action as labor also has a choice to determine where he or she wants to go. Yes, as a government system, as a policy making, it ought to guarantee decent work and social protection. And just a last word here, a social protection policy in this agenda to collapse a whole range of laws seems to have only alienated workers out. If you look at the minimum wages and the social security framework that has come in, where is the voice of the worker there? So long as we see them as beneficiaries, benefactors, and participants of a certain passive kind, I don't think we'll ever understand the nip of the problem that the worker is getting alienated every day. I think that's where I want to, though you may say, Professor Mehrotra, we are giving a grimmer picture I think grimmer, the reality, the important actions need to be placed accordingly. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Arjun Kumar, uh, do you want me to resume my position of chair? Sorry, sir, yes, please. Okay. Um, in which case, I, if I think we don't have any further uh, interventions from the floor, perhaps we can bring this to a close and I might make uh, about four or five remarks uh, Okay. following up on what has been what we've heard. So let me begin by talking about <clears throat> some very excellent points that have been made about statistics. Uh, Radhika is absolutely right. We need um, um, to revive the quinquennial survey. And uh, as a member of the Standing Committee of Economic Statistics uh, of MOSPI, I've been making that point and hopefully we might get through. Let us see. Um, I fully understand what uh, Sarthi is saying about the, the mindset of the NSS. It's not easy to move the NSS. There's no question about it. I've seen it, experienced it for the last one and a half years firsthand. <clears throat> but I should also add that 
several things have improved within the NSS. Let me point those out. And let me also point to what are the difficulties that the NSS itself faces. Um, <clears throat> one thing that has improved is that, um, like the CMI survey, which turns out results you know, very, very frequently, very, very fast, the NSS is also doing a tablet-based survey. So its turnaround time has certainly improved compared to earlier. Having said that, the organization suffers from a number of difficulties and constraints, which I'll come to in a minute. But let me say some other things, one, one or two other things which are, which, which are good, which are happening. You know, all of us who work on the unorganized sector know that there are once in five years surveys of the unorganized sector. Enterprises, we're talking about the enterprise sector. This has been in the past. There is now already a decision and it is already being been implemented that there is an unorganized sector enterprise survey taking place annually. One round is over, that analysis is, the number, number crunching has been done, it has not been made public. That was done in 1920. Please remember, COVID has thrown out of kilter everything. And this is one of the problems. And the second survey, which is called ASUS, the Annual Survey of Unorganized Sector Enterprises, is just started in April. This is the 21-22 second round. The difficulties that the NSS faces are as follows. And one of the reasons why delays took place in the release of data is because this annuality and the, the increase in the periodicity has created you know, physical re human resource constraints within the organization. They collect the data in soft form, in electronic form, but then they have to transfer <laughs> it to external agencies which do the, 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 the collation. Now those agencies need supervision. They themselves, you know, were doing it, needed to be sort of really brought up to speed. Delays have been on account of that. And all of you are absolutely right. The periodicity just doesn't help us. That we, we ultimately end up relying on the CMIE. And we keep making this point that, you know, the government has to put in money into beefing up the strength. Apologies for the word beefing up under the current context. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the staffing, what are you going to do? I mean, if the government does not take employment as a serious concern, then this money is not going to be put there. You're not going to get the periodicity. There is an interest in this data not being generated at the period at the periodicity that you and I would want to see happen. If there was, there would be much greater concern for a, something like that many of you have mentioned an employment policy. Would you would you know that China has had an employment policy for a long time? <clears throat> South Korea has had an employment policy for a very long time. There are 44 countries which have an employment policy. And the one country that needs it doesn't have ours. Enough said about employment policy and statistics. Let me move on to <clears throat> the more depressing issues again. Um, Sarfi mentioned that construction jobs have grown, people have moved out of agriculture, but they are quite casual jobs, they are not very good quality jobs. Having said that, and I have no disagreement with, with Sarfi, there are two upsides which I don't think he mentioned, which are absolutely critical. And what are those two upsides? One, I discovered in my day, in my number crunching, 
that a very significant proportion of the jobs in construction are now in the organized sector. I'm not saying formal jobs, they're in the organized sector. There's LNT, there's Shapurji Palanji. There are a host of other companies that have come onto, onto the scene which didn't exist thanks to the increase in, in public investment into infrastructure that began with the 11th five-year plan, post-2007 in particular. And of course, that was a period when that crowded in private investment in construction. So this is point one. It interests you to know that 2020, in, sorry, in 2012, the NSS told us that half of all construction jobs were in the organized sector, half. I was stunned when I saw that number. The remaining half were on the honor base. The second point, I think, which Sarathi failed to mention, which and he only harped on the negative dimension of the increase in construction jobs, is the following. That because of that massive increase in construction jobs that takes place between 2004 and 2012, a doubling of the construction labor force in the country from 26 million to 51 million in a matter of seven years, millions of people were pulled out of agriculture as a result of which real wages increased in agriculture because the labor market tightened. And because the labor market tightened in rural areas, real wages in the open market rose, which had a knock-on effect on real wages in the, up, in the urban areas. The effect of that was a massive increase in consumption expenditure, which was unprecedented in our country, the result of which was a significant decline in absolute terms in the number of the poor, which had never happened in the history of our country from 73-74 to 2004-05. The absolute number of the poor was, absolute, was exactly the same. For the first time, we raised 140 million people above the poverty line between 4, 5, and 11, 12. Why? Because of construction mainly. And because new, new farm jobs were being created and real wages were rising across the board for, on account of the logic that I've just went into. That is my point two. Point three, Sarthi brought up this question of job, we should, you know, should we take jobs where the people are or the people should go to where the jobs are? We currently have a model that people go to where the jobs are, which is Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu and Kerala and Andhra and, and Gujarat and so on. So, <clears throat> Sarthi is right. I don't think it's e either or. I think he himself, in, this, in a sense, pointed out that our labor force, the number of those in the working age is growing, but the labor force is not increasing at the pace that you would expect it to, given the rise in the working age. The, the, both things have to happen. But what is happening is that people are going where their jobs are, enough, not enough jobs are being created where the people are. That goes back to the question of clusters and cluster, cluster development is a strategy as part of your industrial policy. We, we haven't had an industrial policy for, for 30 years. And by the way, the, the economic decision makers, if I talk to them of that, of that era, pre-2014, admit this. Today, they agree with all the arguments that I make about industry policy. So in other words, today we still in the last seven years have not got an industrial policy, although we keep talking about Make in India and Make in India is not industrial policy. Hopefully, if a new government was there with the erstwhile leaders, we might get an industrial policy. Because we must remember that jobs are where? The jobs are in the MSMEs. The jobs are in the clusters in the MSMEs. And it would interest you to know, and I'll move on from this point, um, is that tomorrow there'll be a release of very important data collected by MSME organizations, a cluster of, sort of, not cluster, but a, a federation of MSME organizations across the country have done a survey of how they have been treated and how they have fared under COVID. <clears throat> so if you focused a little bit more on cluster development, the jobs will be created there. So people are right there. 
the young people, the girls in particular, who've been talking about repeatedly, who've gotten better education, they don't want to be in the SAGs. They don't want to be in SAGs. Forget about it. You, you, there is not a hope in hell that you will be able to employ, engage them in SAGs because their aspirations are different. They've gotten all better educated. I, I mean, I could, I could go on on this, but I won't. My third point. I will. <clears throat> The demographic dividend was mentioned and the TFR was also mentioned. We've hit TFR of 2.1. We already have. But the, I think not enough leaders and not even enough academics or policymakers recognize that in maximum 20 years, our dividend will be over. That means the share, the de dependent population is going to start increasing again. We will become an aging society from being a youthful society. The number of people entering the, uh, entering the working age is rising just now, will go on rising, and therefore the labor force will rise until 2030. The labor force will begin to, will continue to increase in absolute terms 2030 to 2040, but at a decreasing rate, at a decelerating rate. And, and by 2040 latest, the number of entrants into the labor force is going to become negative. What does this imply for us? That means we have to generate at least between now and at least 2030, 10 million new non-farm jobs because no one wants to be in agriculture. The young, the, the young don't want to be and their parents don't want to be in agriculture. We, we, we know this. Right? And certainly the girls don't want to be in it. The girls who've gotten better educated, we've got to think of, you know, the female labor force participation rate in two, in two different ways. One for the adult poorly educated women who've come out of agriculture and can only do SAG work, there's precious little they will do or can do. But the young girls, they need non-farm work close to where they live. And certainly cluster development for and, and a focus on a new focus on MSMEs would, 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 would be required. Because, <clears throat> because it's not just that we've got to create new jobs for those entering the labor. You've got to create jobs for those who have to be pulled out of agriculture. We've still got 42% of our workforce in agriculture. And it needs to drop to something like 30 as our population continues to grow. So we have to create non-farm jobs for which an industrial policy aligned with an employment policy is absolutely essential. And if we are not generating those jobs now, then the third group for which we need to generate jobs are those who are currently unemployed. Uh, at a minimum, that's 30 million. Openly unemployed, which had increased between 2012 and 2019 by <laughs> something like 20 million. And of course, now the additional unemployed on account of COVID. So we have a crisis on our hands, which is unprecedented in the history of our country. And in, we, to put a slightly slight silver lining on this, let me say that between 2000 and 2012, we were generating seven and a half million new non-farm jobs per annum. The only downside between 99, 2000 and 2004 was that I'm talking about seven and a half million non-farm. The only downside between 99, 2000, 2004, four, five, was that the absolute number of workers in agriculture in the first half of the last decade was still increasing. Right. Last meaning the, fir the first decade of this century. That's a real problem. So it was not true structural transformation taking place. However, <clears throat> since four, five, until at least 12, we were generating seven and a half million non-farm jobs. So it's, we've done it before we can do it, but we were growing at 8%. Are we growing at anywhere close to that since then? And are we likely to grow anywhere close to that from this point onwards? Very unlikely. For reasons that I think are beyond the scope of this discussion, let me, my fourth point, and then I want to sort of finish. So, 
quality of jobs was mentioned a number of times. On that, I just want to make two sets of points very quickly. The Social Security Code of 2020, on which I have no hesitation in saying, because I've now worked on this very, very carefully. I submitted very detailed comments at the request of the Standing Committee on Labor of Parliament when the, when the draft code was still under discussion in the Standing Committee in April, May of last, still April, May of last year. 19 of my suggestions were incorporated, in fact, in the Standing Committee's report to the Ministry of Labor. Practically none of those suggestions were incorporated. Anything sensible that was in the Standing Committee was not incorporated in the law, which was passed within seconds in Parliament, like, like the three farm laws. And this draft, this draft that was passed was in some ways you know, worse than the third draft that we had been discussing earlier. So if you have any expectations that the, the quality of jobs is going to improve because of the SS code, I think we are all living in cloud cuckoo land. There's, there might be a possibility because the government of India has sought a loan from the World Bank and the ADB right now which is under negotiate, which is about to go under negotiation, in which they might get about ten, about uh, one and a half billion dollars for social protection. I've just done a paper for the Asian Development Bank on the on a possible design or an architecture for a social security system for informal workers, a detailed design. I'm hoping that that becomes the part of the discussion between the government on the one hand and the ADB and the World Bank on the other. Finally, on, well, on skills, since Sita raised that issue and so did a number of speakers. Our skill ecosystem as it has evolved in the last 10 years is broken. There is just no question about it that it is broken, no matter how much the government would like to pretend otherwise, because there are two requirements for a skill ecosystem to evolve in a way that actually genuinely skills young people to enable them to get jobs. Because the way pe young people are being skilled, they're being only enabled to reinforce a point that Sarthi made. They're being only enabled to join the informal sector. Why? Because as Sarthi rightly said, they are half educated young people who enter these, these training institutions and you provide them with short-term training, three to four months, which means essentially you quarter skill them, half educated being quarter skilled. How do you expect them to get formal sector jobs? Even if they were growing, which, that, which they are not, which we spend our, spent our time discussing. Point one. So our skill ecosystem itself is broken. There's a second dimension of this, which is there's precious little involvement of the organized formal private sector in infirm enterprise-based training. Successful systems across the globe are those <clears throat> where it's not government-driven, government-financed, government-managed. It's the other way around. And we haven't quite understood that and we haven't quite understood how to bring industry. Sector skill councils have not announced. Anyone who's seen our report of 2017, which we did at the request of the Ministry of Skill Development, it's called the Sharda Prasad Committee Report, exposes Skill India completely. And very finally, very finally, cash transfers. Um, I don't think, Sarthi, anyone takes seriously the notion of a universal basic income of the kind that Pranabardhan or Joshi were discussing in that seminar that both you and I were there at, or even Arvind Subramaniam for that matter. If anyone in this audience is interested, a year ago after COVID broke, I did a paper for ICREA, which uh, is available on the ICREA website, which does provide the design for identifying who's, who should get it and who should not get it. If you gave it to about 60% of rural and 40% of urban, 
based on the socioeconomic caste census, it's fairly easy, easy to identify these people. It is desperately needed today, in addition and on top of Manrika. If you want to revive aggregate demand, this is one of the things that's needed. And it can be substitutive of PM Kisan because PM Kisan doesn't reach tenant farmers. It reaches only owner cultivators. Two, it doesn't reach a landless labor. And three, it doesn't reach any rural non-farm poor workers, nor does it reach the urban poor. So who is it meant for? The owner cultivators, the best of them in the rural areas. And it's more aggressive than, than that. Because what has happened is that within the family, if land was not so far, land, land was just registered under one name, the father. Now we know that the land is actually being divided already between let's say two sons, or there are five sons. All of them have got the land registered on their, name, their names and each one is claiming PM Kisan, would you like to know? That's how the budget is, is where it is. And my suggestion is simply add another 10,000 crores and you will include many more. Anyway, let me stop there. Thank you all very much. Uh, it has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, very enriching. And Arjun, back to you. Yes, and those also who want to uh, listen more to uh, Sir's lecture and suggestion, we also had Sir's uh, lecture on the issue of labor, employment, and pandemic policy suggestion, the way forward. Sir saw the papers which he was mentioning also there, videos and all, and you can hear it on Facebook, YouTube, or any of the podcast, as Sir was mentioning. Sir, a very last question to you. Uh, what would you suggest for the uh, potential third wave, uh, for especially the employment situation in India? Sir, the potential third wave, what should third wave, of back, third wave of COVID? COVID, yes, sir. COVID and the vaccination. How do you see uh, going this year ahead in the short term? What should be the strategy? Friend, don't even get me started. Don't even get me started <clears throat> because I've taken the, the union government to, to the Supreme Court on this matter, on what is un, in, no question about it in my mind from the beginning a disastrous vaccine policy, which is in violation of the nas national vaccine policy of 2011. It's in violation of the practice of 40 years of the universal program of immunization. It is a violation of Article 14 of Article 21 of the Indian constitution. We have never done this. And no country in the world has done what our government has done of <clears throat> allowing 25% of limited supply of vaccine limited supply of vaccine in a country which could have been a mass exporter, we are becoming a, ma we are, we are a mass importer. Why? Because of failures of policy. And now we decide to tie one of our hands at the back by handing over 25%. Where did this 25% to the private sector come from? Where did this share come from? Do we know if 25% of people can actually afford to pay 800 rupees or 1200 rupees or 1500 rupees? Do we know? No. We don't. Probably no more than four or five percent of the population will be able to pay. So, all this propaganda about free vaccine is precisely that it is propaganda. Okay. The vaccination is a public good. We have to rapidly vaccinate 940 million people. And what is the May rate? You'll see a paper soon in EPW where we estimate <clears throat> that if the May rate of daily vaccination was to be was to, to be continued, you are going to be able to vaccinate India by late 2023. UP by 2025. If you double the rate, then India by late 2022. If you triple the May rate, then the best, best case scenario by, by March of 22. There is no way that you're stopping a, sec a third wave. It is coming. It's only a few weeks away. There is just no question about it. We lost too much time. The countries which are other major manufacturers of, of, of vaccines, the US had already booked their vaccines from mid-July 
last year. When did we book our first vaccine? 11 million was the size of the order in early January. Did we not know that we had to vaccinate 940 million people? And two times two, because you have two doses. Did we not know this from, from, from ever and ever? And our second order comes in April. Why did we make a budget allocation for 35,000 crores? Why? And then say, oh, states, you can do it. Oh, the private sector, you can do it. Do I have to say more? No, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So let me just quickly propose a vote of thanks. Sarthi, sir, would you like to add any line on the subject? Well, really not. Santosh said a lot, except that any coming of the third wave, let's hope it does come. But if it comes, I mean, it's going to be a crisis. I think, uh, it's, uh, I think it's already getting late. I would just say one thing, just one, that there is no substitute in the short term for skill formation. And therefore, there is need to relook at the skill system whole skill system and education system in a perspective such that it starts today but keeps rolling on a continuing basis for the next at least 10 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So let me quickly propose just a brief vote of thanks. So uh, thank you so much for joining th this uh, Impre hashtag web policy talk here on Zoom and Facebook Live. And those would be watching it later on YouTube and our, our podcast. So on behalf of Impre Center for Work and Welfare, Impre Impact and Policy Research Institute and Counterview, we thank you for joining us on our special series, The State of Employment and Livelihood, hashtag employment debate. And for today's uh, deliberation, special lecture by the uh, by Professor Sarthi Acharya on the state of employment in India, impact and the way forward with special reference to the coronavirus pandemic. We are very thankful to you, sir. I would also express our uh, humble gratitude to other participants and especially Professor Santosh Mehrotra for agreeing to chair and steer this deliberation and uh, uh, very uh, excellent uh, concluding remarks also. Thank you so much, sir. We are also very thankful to uh, Dr. Sandhya Ayer, ma'am, Dr. Radhika Kapoor, ma'am, uh, Professor A.V. Joseph also joined, and Professor Sita Prabhu, ma'am, also joined, and all those who tuned in here. Thank you for being with us. Uh, have a good night, and please take care. Thank you. Thank you once again, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I will share the video soon. Great.